Welcome to another conversation with a distinguished visitor to Hope College. Today, we're talking with Dr. James Person, a historian with the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Dr. Person is on our campus as a part of the Great Decision Series of the World Affairs Council of West Michigan, of which Hope College is an educational partner. Dr. Person, welcome to Hope College. Thank you, President Knapp. Happy to be here. Your topic in your lecture today had to do with American perceptions or perhaps misperceptions of the relationship between China and North Korea. And I think it's true that we often view China as having tremendous influence with North Korea, or perhaps we view North Korea as something of a client state of China. And in our current presidential election year, we've heard at least one of the candidates talking about the need to apply more pressure on China, so they might in turn apply more pressure on North Korea regarding nuclear armament. Would you just say a few words about why it is that you believe America has misunderstood the potential of China to influence North Korea? Well, that's a great question, and unfortunately, I think I've heard from almost every presidential candidate uh, the need to uh, uh, pressure China to do more. I think it really goes back to um, uh, this, uh, what I like to call the Middle Kingdom mentality. Uh, up through the late 19th century, China was, was um, uh, this, this head of this uh, uh, almost a cultural sphere that, um, uh, where, where it maintained uh, suzerain vassal relations with a lot of the countries on, on its periphery. Now, if you look at the uh, Korean documentation, they never saw themselves, uh, going back to the, for example, the Chosun Dynasty, which ruled from 1392 to 1910 in Korea, they never really saw themselves as being beneath China, but they understood there was a need to, to work with the Chinese, to pay tribute to them, uh, and this would then get them access to China's vast trade networks and to, um, and also guarantee China's um, well, if ever Korea was invaded by another party, such as Japan, for example, uh, China did come in and help. So it provided security and access to trade. Uh, I think we're, we're seeing a continuation of this. So we, we continue to think that, that China and, and North Korea still are not sovereign equals. Um, uh, we uh, also tend to look at China's assistance to North Korea during the Korean War. In fact, when you ask people today, what, what is it about the relationship? What, what, why do you think that, that China and North Korea are so close? And why, do you, why is it that China is um, you know, the big brother? Uh, they say, well, because China bailed out the North Koreans during the Korean War. The problem is a lot can happen in seven decades. And what we can see from the historical record, um, uh, primarily from the diplomatic record of North Korea's former communist allies, these are documents that have come from former communist archives, you know, Russian, uh, Polish, Romanian, Albanian, is that um, a lot has happened over the past seven decades uh, to the point where there is a profound sense of mistrust in North Korea toward China. This, this in fact, concern that China uh, has never really, it, itself, never really abandoned this Middle Kingdom mentality and that China may not see North Korea as a sovereign equal. And this is something that really has bothered the North Koreans for decades. Because they, I think more than anything, yes, they're communists, but more than anything, they're, they're anti-colonial revolutionary nationalists. And they're so hardwired to this idea of sovereign equality and to, and, and, and to their sovereignty that uh, whenever they perceive a, 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 a you know, interference from China, for example, they get very upset, they get very prickly about it. And we've seen this time and again, uh, so that today, um, so for example, if, you know, by asking China to, to do our bidding and to you know, ask the North Koreans to, to behave, we're essentially asking them to do precisely what North Korea has most resented over the past seven plus decades. So what's the alternative? Well, uh, we see that the North Koreans have been trying to talk to the United States since at least the mid-1970s. There was a, a brief period of inter-Korean dialogue that, uh, that happened that occurred just when you see detente with the Soviets and then also rapprochement with, between the U.S. and, and, and uh, China. So in the early 70s, this lessening of tensions um, uh, between the communist bloc and, 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 uh, and the West. 
And uh, the two Koreas began talking. Within two years, though, the North Koreans realized that nothing was going to really happen on the peninsula without the direct participation of the United States. So in early 1974, they began making these peace, peaceful overtures to the United States, saying, let's scrap the armistice that ended the Korean War and replace that with a peace treaty. Let's normalize relations. Um, the United States didn't have any interest in this. They saw no value in talking to the North Koreans. And so over the next two decades, the North Koreans again and again and again tried to talk to the United States. Uh, and we largely ignored them. Sometimes for good reasons, because the North Korean proposal, you know, excluding South Korea, for example, wasn't acceptable to us. But other times it was just because we didn't see any, you know, there were no economic interests in, in North Korea. Uh, it was just a small player and it wasn't worth the, worth the, 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 the trouble. But the fact that North Korea has been trying to talk to us for so long um, suggests that we, the United States, have more influence than anyone. Um, and, and so uh, I think it would be in our interest if we really want to prevent this, the conditions under which North Korea thinks that um, uh, military adventurism or, or provocative act, you know, actions like, like we've seen carrying out is the best way to achieve their diplomatic goals. We need to talk to them. One final question. In your lecture last evening at Aquinas College, you talked about the prospects of a reunification of North and South Korea, which seems a distant dream today, but there certainly have been times of thaw. And during those times, there have actually been family reunions where families in North and South Korea could see one another again. But I wonder, now that we're generations into this divided land, um, are those families still really a, a meaningful connection between the two nations and are, in fact, uh, the cultures of the two countries so developed in opposite directions now that it's becoming less and less possible to reconcile the two nations with any shared sense of, of um, commonality or purpose or family? Now, that's an excellent question. And this is the great tragedy on the Korean Peninsula is these, the, uh, tearing apart these, these families, the divided families. Yeah, there really is uh, this, this division. Uh, you know, 71 years of Korea is, is really... Uh, uh, it's an aberration. It's it's just, it's yeah, a country that was was unified, you know, a single uh, homogeneous um, uh, uh, entity for over a thousand years. So some decades ago, when they first started these family reunions, um, there were just a, a, a large number. I, I unfortunately don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but a large number of of, of applicants of families that applied to go and, 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 and be part of these exchanges uh, that were run through the Red Cross, the North Korean and South Korean Red Cross, over half of the original applicants are no longer with us. Hmm. So um, it's uh, imperative that, that we regularize this process of, of family exchanges because once they're gone, you won't have anything that's you know really um, uh, compelling the, the North and, and South to work together. Um, they are one of the last uh, uh, things sort of, you know, keeping, uh, keeping up pressure on both, both governments to, to try to, uh, to work together and to try to reach some sort of agreement or settlement. I'm not suggesting unification, but, but at least having some sort of uh, modus vivendi where they can, um, where these families can, can, can work together and, and hopefully that will lead to further um, uh, cooperation in, in family exchanges and in, in cultural exchanges, and, and that could lead uh, to more um, and, and, and perhaps to a, a lessening of tensions. Um, without, without these families, though, I, just, I see very few prospects for, you know, there's no real pressure on the regimes then other than security and redu the interest in reducing uh, security tensions on the peninsula. But that's really the greatest tragedy. And, and I certainly, I hope and pray that, that uh, uh, at some point in the future, um, we can, um, uh, we will see uh, some, some major developments in that. Well, thank you. Yeah. We've been talking with Dr. James Person, historian with the public policy program of the Wilson Center in Washington, DC. He's on the Hope College campus today to speak with us about the China-North Korea relationship.